you know, Dennis is uh, one of my heroes uh, from, from a long time ago, back from the, the very earliest works. So- my name is Asta Symes and welcome to Live Longer World. I really enjoyed your book, Dance to the Tune of Life. Um, I think it's such an eye-opening book. And I know one thing you mentioned in the book is why neo-Darwinism is a reductionist approach to biology and is, for all practical purposes, incorrect. And instead, you're advocating for a more integrative systems approach, which I'm sure we'll dive into. But I want to ask you one thing on your journey, which is that you, in fact, say that you started from a reductionist camp when you were studying ion channels and cell membranes, which you did pioneering work in. So my question is, did some of your work studying ion channels inform the approach you take to systems biology now? It does, but realizations later than occurred at the time. You see, amongst the physiologists I was working with at University College London, I was regarded as doing close to the most reductionist account of a biological process as you could have single channels in membranes enabling processes to occur. And it seemed as though investigating the processes there, representing them by sets of differential equations, was automatically a very reductionist approach compared to those who are looking at the effects of hormones on a system as a whole, those who are looking at the whole gastric system, those looking at the whole immune system, you can begin to see why that was characterized by others largely, but accepted by me at the time, that this was effectively a reductionist approach. It was later that I came to realize that if you come to understand that all of that is integrated through the cell surface voltage, which is a global property of the cell, you are not being reductionist at all. You're actually saying the accumulation of all of that movement of charge is contributing to that electrical phenomenon. And therefore, in the end, what you're doing is talking about a higher level of causation Uh, than the components of the cell. So that's why, in the end, I came to see it as being a top-down process. But it wasn't the way I viewed it when I first published in 1960. I would have been shocked if somebody had told me then, Dennis, you are the most non-reductionist physiologist possible. Well, that that would have deeply shocked me then. But it doesn't shock me now. And in fact, I see the Hodgkin cycle, which is that interaction between the electrical global property of the cell membrane and the individual components of the ion channels as being one of the prime examples of a global property influencing the molecular properties. Interesting. Okay, so say... There's a young researcher who comes to you and says that, Professor Dennis, I'm looking at ion channels and their role in cancer. And I also want to take the systems level approach. Would you say that it's okay on recognizing that the cell voltage and the voltage of cell membranes is a global property and then applying that with the more specific reductionist approach? How would you, what advice would you give to combine the two approaches perhaps? Well, you have to combine the two. I don't reject the reductionist approach. You need the upward causation from the individual molecular components as well as the constraints from the global property of the cells, tissues, organs, and so on. So I don't reject the um, reductionist approach. I incorporate it into what I see as inevitably a multi-level approach to causation in biological systems. So um, I am still at heart, therefore, a reductionist in the sense that I want to calculate 
how those iron channels contribute to the function they contribute to, but at the same time recognize that they are constrained not only by the particular um, potential of that cell, but also through connections between the various cells, um, the properties from a global point of view of the whole tissue and then of the whole organ and so on. You cannot, for example, understand a cardiac arrhythmia like a ventricular fibrillation at the level of a single cell. You, you have to understand how waves of re-excitation can travel around the ventricle. And that depends on very many things. The particular fiber structures that occur in the ventricle of the heart, um, which pathways are likely to be good and which not. And the um, variations in the ion channel mechanisms that give rise to differences in the duration of the electrical event in different parts of the heart. That is, as it were, beautifully orchestrated to try to prevent re-excitation, which is to say that the very structure of the heart, as it is, um, as the density of ion channels varies from, let's say, the base of the um, ventricle to the tip of the ventricle, how those changes um, are orchestrated is itself a way of trying to prevent those arrhythmias. So once you see all of that, you naturally see, um, at that case, in that case, an organ level constraint of the molecular processes, which means you just can't understand a ventricular arrhythmia just from the reductionist viewpoint. Yeah, so maybe now is a good time actually to talk about um, some of the flaws you think with neo-Darwinism, because that seems to take a very reductionist approach, only perhaps looking at molecules in the DNA. So what would you say is wrong with neo-Darwinism? Oh, absolutely everything. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me clarify that a little bit. <laughs> um, well, it's got so many assumptions about um, molecular biological processes that I think are simply incorrect. Number one, it claims, as Dawkins does in his books and as many um, of the more, how should I put it? I mean, there are, there are different varieties of people who favor the modern synthesis, as it is often called. And some are very much neo-Darwinists, some are less so. But taking in a broad way, one of the critical claims is that DNA can replicate itself like a crystal. That was introduced by Alvin Schrödinger in 1942. He didn't know the genetic material would be DNA, but he did know that it would have to have been at a molecular level in order for there to be enough information to be transmitted down the generation. So... At that time, of course, physicists were using X-ray crystallography to understand the structure of very big molecules. I remember watching Dorothy Hodgkin here in Oxford at the time when she was working on insulin and then later on penicillin and working out the structures of those complicated systems by using X-ray crystallography. Now, what that led um, Schrodinger to do was to say, well, there's no problem about reproduction of the molecular sequence of whatever the genetic material is. Of course, we now know it's DNA. Um, it's just that, you know, as we now realize, the base pairs come to join each other up together as the system unravels and forms a new pair of DNA molecules. Well, up to a point it does. And that point is known to be accurate to about one in 10,000 base pairs. Now, if you and I wrote a, an article and there was only one typo in a 10,000 word article, we'd be very pleased. But this is nowhere near enough for a DNA sequence of three billion base pairs. There would be half a million, at least, of errors at the rate at which self-replication can occur. 
What happens? The cell orchestrates a system of cut and paste enzymes which come in and, well, one says laboriously, but actually they do it very quickly. I mean, they work systematically going along the, the loops of the DNA as it's unraveled and then put back together and correcting all of those errors. Now, that's a system property. We don't know how to reproduce that outside a living organism. So I would say to the neo-Darwinist, DNA does not self-replicate. It can't. And it needs a living cell to do so. And indeed, outside a living cell, if you put all of my DNA, as Richard Dawkins told me two years ago in a debate with him, Dennis, we could inscribe your DNA in blocks of granite, the C's, G's, A's and T's, and we'd keep those blocks of granite for 10,000 years, and then we'd be able to recreate you. I said, no, you can't. Why not? Well, where would you get my mother's egg cell as it was in 1936? Well, you can see that the point here, it led people to a very simplistic idea that from DNA, you could automatically recreate um, a person, uh, a, a, an organism, uh, exactly as it is uh, in, in its first incarnation, if you like. We can all be uh, reincarnated as many times as we wish. Well, one, one might sort of wish to be a bit of a Buddhist in all of this and get away with that. But I don't think even the Buddhists would accept that that was the way they were going to do it, if they do it at all. Uh, so I I think there's there's the first break it seems to me, in the neo-Darwinist mould. DNA simply does not replicate like a crystal. You have to have a living organism to enable it to do so. The second one is this lovely thing called the Weissman barrier. That's the idea that the germ cells in the future egg and sperm are protected from any changes in the body. Well, Darwin never agreed with that. He actually introduced a theory which he couldn't prove at the time. He admitted he couldn't prove it. He invented the idea that the body naturally transmits information from its cells to the germline to enable information to be passed on to the next generation. He was ridiculed for that idea by uh, Wallace, one of his co-discoverers of the theory of natural selection, and uh, by Weissman, and Weissman particularly, just after Vi um, just after Darwin's death in uh, 1882, in 1883, he proclaimed the necessity of the Weissman barrier. That is, there's no way in which cell tissue and organ properties can be transmitted to the germline. Well, we found the vesicles that do that, and for around 20 years now, we've known that all cells in the body are pouring out tiny packets that give a snapshot of many of the control molecules that are con uh, concerned with the metabolism and other processes occurring in those cells. And those um, vesicles have been shown to transmit down to the germline, to carry RNAs, even DNA, to the germ cells. So I think the Weissman barrier is not any longer a barrier. Um, now, I forgot what the third one was, but I have around three molecular biological mechanisms that the neo-Darwinists assume that, that just don't work um, when you work them through. Now, those are two of them, and I'm sure during this conversation I'll remember the third. Um, can I ask, uh, Dennis, um, on, that, on that last point, are you, are you emphasizing that there is a parallel heredity mechanism functioning uh, alongside DNA in terms of these vesicles. I mean, there's other cytoplasmic components, uh, cytoskeleton, of course, yeah. and so on. Or, uh, and or, are you, or, or are you emphasizing the idea that once you've passed on that material, it can actually get integrated into the genome and then also pass along along the conventional route? Like how, how important is that aspect? Yes, both, I think, can occur. And we know that because, um, after all, we we have a huge amount of our DNA. It's more than the DNA involved in protein coding. 
that's come from viruses. I mean, it's clear that incorporation of new DNA from other organisms into the germline has occurred many times uh, during <laughs> the process of evolution. So I think we can say there's both occurring. Epigenetic inheritance, of course, which would be, let's say, RNAs determining how much of a gene is expressed, will be transmitted down through the germline. And, and uh, the possibility of actual new DNA being incorporated into the germline, I think both can occur. Now, I think we need to emphasize another major point here. You're going to have to give space for those future experiments that characterize that in greater detail to occur. Um, even major standard evolutionary biologists will now accept epigenetic inheritance. Putuma has done so just last year in a review article that he published. He's one of the big textbook writers uh, from the modern synthesis point of view. His textbook just called Evolution, whole 600 pages of it. Um, and he's now accepted that we have to take into account epigenetic inheritance in addition to the DNA inheritance. But I would say we now need to make it possible for people to get the grants necessary to pursue these ideas uh, more in more detail than has been pursued at the moment. The reason is very simple. The, the, the point I would make is this. We can follow with fluorescent labeling of RNAs, DNAs, and proteins, we can follow around two, three, four, perhaps a little bit more molecules at the same time. But that's a tiny fraction of what any vesicle can contain. So it's tedious work. You have, first of all, to decide which of the molecules you're going to uh, label with fluorescent labels and you're limited in the number you can do that have different um, colors of fluorescence if you're going to identify those molecules in the vesicles and indeed that's the only way you can visualize the vesicles because they're too tiny to be visualized by standard microscopy labeling with fluorescent dyes is about the only way we can um, easily identify what molecules have been passed down from the vesicles to the germ cells. But that's very restrictive, you see, because there will be millions of different molecules in a single vesicle. To be faced with only being able to label three or four of those, otherwise we can't make out the, the differences, is very tedious. So. I think we're going to have to be, um, well, first of all, people investigating those kinds of processes are going to have to be given the funding and the space necessary to do it. It's very important to do it. But at the same time, it's going to be tedious and take time to really work out. So that's why I think the presumption which... Well, I interact now with a whole group of around a dozen uh, younger academics working in trying to get the funding for the experiments they want to perform. And almost universally, they say that most of their grants are rejected. And the reason is very simple. It is that the rejection will be on the basis that it just simply disagrees with standard theory. Well, we have to break out of that mindset. Um, Dennis, um, uh, in your estimate, just a ballpark, what percentage of the information that is used by an organism, let's say embryogenesis onwards, is genetic versus all other sources put together? What, what, what would you guess as a, as a breakdown? I guess. Um... Yeah, just the rel you know, relative weighing of what, yes. how, mu how much you do think is actually in the primary DNA sequence versus all the other you know, epigenetic stuff that can, that can exist. I don't think we really know. Um, see, if, if, even, if, even if you just ask the question, how does a developing embryo um, 
from the earliest stages, let's say, initially two, four, eight, and 16 cells, eventually gastrulation into a three-dimensional object, how do all of those differentiations occur into what in the adult may be around 200 different types of cell, distinguishable by the protein um, concentrations, the variations, therefore, in gene expression. And clearly, that is enormous as a range of variation. We're talking, aren't we, about, in some cases, cells with long fibrous tissue that can form a nerve cell compared to uh, a liver cell which is focusing on metabolism. And so I would say the epigenetic inheritance that has to occur there and how it occurs must be contributing a very large fraction indeed to the differentiation process. But what do we know at the moment? We know that the cells do start to differentiate and that as they go from being stem cells to being, um, what should we call it, specific types of stem cells and then finally into the uh, adult cells, that all of that is orchestrated by epigenetic processes. It seems to me that the potential information there is at least as great as the three billion base pairs of DNA. I don't know how to calculate it, really. And I some time ago um, published a paper on the, um, well, what I called the analog and digital information in single cells. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the digital information in DNA is easy to compute. You've got three billion base pairs. You can convert that into a binary uh, form and, and get a, an idea of the total amount of information. With the analog information, which is the structure of it all, and an egg cell is an exceedingly complex structure with all of the organelles inside the cell as well as the cell itself. Um, I mean, you can represent it, of course, at any, almost any degree of information if you convert that into digital information. Um, it's analog in the sense that it's not how best to put this. I mean, yes, at an individual molecular level, you could imagine computing it all um, digitally, but, but that's too fine a grid to really be useful. At any reasonable grid um, uh, density for determining the total amount of analog information, I think it's easy to show and I have shown that, that the total amount of information can easily exceed the three billion base pairs of the DNA. But then how do you do the comparison? I mean, one is, as I said, analog, the other digital. It's never going to be possible to come to a precise way of representing the comparative influence of those forms of inheritance. I mean, yeah, you know, one one thing that makes it hard to, to quantify is that uh, we have to first agree on what what the observer is that's interpreting the information. So it's easy for DNA because we've we've decided that it's the it's the uh, the specific base pairs and the groups of them that that matter, and so that's what we quantify. But in these other in these other scenarios, we have to first say what is the actual observable that the rest of the biological system is is interpreting as information. And, and, and probably many of them overlapping, right? So that makes it much harder. But I, you know, I, I wasn't even trying to quantify the information. I was just sort of um, imagining, like imagine the, the biology textbook of, from 50 years from now. And so let's say it's a thousand pages long. And so now the question is, how many of those pages are about DNA and all the DNA associated, associated material versus how much of it, you know, where is the emphasis? I would, that's kind of, I like to try to think forward and say- I okay, think we, that, yes. Now, that's not too difficult to answer, Mike. I, I think they're going to be at least equal. 
<laughs> that's that's my best guess. And that that sometime those textbooks will have to be written to take that into account. I'm curious when you say that it probably lies in some of these epigenetic processes. I mean, do we know or have theories on what what the epigenetic processes entail, some of the more specifics of what, what it includes? Well, it, it, it's a, the, the original definition of epigenetics, of course, was Waddington's way, way back in 1950s. Um, and he saw it as an, a general um, constraining of the actions of individual genes by the organism as a whole. He didn't have the concept of epigenetics that we have today, which is that of marking of particular parts of the DNA with methylation or whatever other process might occur, and the marking of the um, histone molecules, both of which can alter DNA expression. So now I've already forgotten what your question was. Sorry about this. Um, yes. Can you can you remind me again? Yeah, no, I was asking more if we know some specifics of what epigenetics and epigenetic processes may include. Maybe it's like one piece of it is say iron channels and bioelectricity. Maybe there's another component of it. Well, I I would say it's occurring everywhere. You know, wherever there is uh, a need to alter gene expression, it, it is epigenetics that will do it. When I exercise, for example, I am telling my muscles to make more um, actin and myosin. I mean, I'm not telling them, as it were, deliberately like that. Well, in a sense, I am. I'm exercising. And, you know, and I know, as a matter of fact, that, that will um, tell the relevant cells to grow uh, more of those uh, proteins. So it seems to me that this must be ubiquitous that that it's it's like a um a continuous rain of epigenetic effects on the organism and its cells not just an occasional intervention that we might think about and um so i i take the view that at base the DNA information, that's the sort of hard inheritance, if you want to call it that, with the epigenetic being sometimes described as soft inheritance. That's, as it were, the basic, which without which there wouldn't be the proteins that we make anyway. And that's straightforward. This bit of DNA codes for this protein. That, that's fine. We can quantify that pretty accurately now. But the epigenetic processes are not like that they they're almost continuously variable and it, it depends in my case how often do i go to my um, dance club tutor and uh, and get trained in prancing around the dance hall i'm well i do that as often as i can now because i'm trying to look after my health there's another fact but the point i'm making is that um, this will vary enormously from individual to individual. And so when I think about it, I, I usually feel that the epigenetic changes are far and away the bigger ones. So I know both you and Mike disagree that DNA or, or agree that DNA is not the blueprint for life. It doesn't have the code for life. I'm curious then, do you think there is a code for life somewhere else, perhaps in some of the epigenetic processes, or is is that no. not fair to say? No, I don't think of it that way. I think life itself is the creator of life. Now, you might think that's a, a bit of a get out. Well, it is, and I understand that. But at the same time, I think we've got to We've got to recognize that living organisms have certain properties that are just almost by definition true of them. Um, they have purposive behavior. They have uh, the ability 
uh, to alter what their DNA is doing, possibly even altering their DNA. Well, immune systems are doing that all the time. When we get invaded by a new virus, we quickly create new DNA to enable an immunoglobulin to tackle that new virus. I would say that um, not only is life definitively capable of purposive behavior, um, but um, that it's definitively capable of altering what it is doing. And that's that's difficult, philosophically speaking, isn't it? I mean, so much so that when you read Fatuma's textbook, he has, of his 600 pages, he has only one page which is devoted to philosophical issues. And the statement on that page is quite straightforward. There is no room for purposive behaviour in science. Full stop. Any justification of that statement? No. Any thinking that there might be a philosophical need for a justification of that and to at least say, is that characteristic of life or not? No, not at all. It's as though, oh dear, it's as though these people are thinking in a philosophical vacuum, to my mind anyway. But there we are. There, There is my um, comment on and I've already commented on Futuma's book. It's got it's got many other errors, complete misrepresentation of what Lamarck thought. But there's another aspect of the story there. Now, the more I have studied the texts and um, including the textbooks, but also some of the more popular texts like uh, Jerry Coyne's Why Evolution is True, like Richard Dawkins, his many books on selfish gene and similar ideas and the various editions of uh, John Maynard Smith's The Theory of Evolution which was a, a standard text to many people as I was growing up <laughs> the more I see that there is almost a an agreement amongst them all to rule certain things out of court that you cannot even talk about them. So you cannot talk about Lamarck because he was totally wrong. Well, and, and, and they make the mistake of attributing to Lamarck actually the theory of his great opponent in Paris all of those years ago, Georges Cuvier. I've researched his work to that degree. So first of all, I don't trust them on what they say about the history of their subject, and in particular, what they say about Lamarck. He was not, incidentally, a man favouring the idea that there was some special energy in life. He's, he's often presented that way, as though um, le pouvoir de la vie is what, what he expressed in French, the power of life. He was a materialist. Even I am not a materialist in the same sense as Lamarck. But the idea of, of attributing to Lamarck a kind of form of spiritualism, I think, is just way, way outside the uh, range of what people should say uh, about Lamarck. I'm, I'm about to try and publish articles on Lamarck that say all of this, incidentally. And I think on the major principles of evolution, he and Darwin were not in serious disagreement. That's the extraordinary conclusion I've come to. But there's just a, a major fact about uh, the textbooks. I've also carefully studied the four editions over 40 years of John Maynard Smith's book, um, just called The Theory of Evolution. He wrote that because he was not himself originally a biologist. He was an engineer trained to build aircraft and that's what he did during the second world war uh, or design aircraft um, from an engineering perspective he wrote the theory of evolution in order to teach himself the biology now moreover i think of all the um textbook writers or popular book writers because i suppose his 
the theory of evolution is more like a popular book than a textbook. And many people have used it as a textbook. Um, it's it's interesting to see the process of a very clever thinker. And John Maynard Smith was a very clever thinker about evolution coming so close at various points to disowning the modern synthesis, but he never actually made that that switch. What he did was to say, I don't agree with Weissman, so he never accepted Weissman's barrier idea. Um, he certainly did not think that epigenetics was a, a, a mere will, will of the wisp, something that wasn't very important. And um, when it came to uh, questions like, does DNA replicate like a crystal? I'm afraid he on that, he just simply went along with the standard story. He'd never appreciated the difficulties with the concept that DNA replicates like a crystal. But that is characteristic of nearly all the neo-Darwinist modern synthesis or whatever you want to call them. I therefore think that actually it's time we rewrote textbooks. <laughs> the, um, and I'm even discussing with one of my own associations, the International Union of Physiological Sciences, how that might now be done, because I think it's necessary. Um, so, so Dennis, we, we've we've talked about a number of ideas. Uh, w which, or maybe something else, do you think is really the most fundamental? In other words, if you had if you had one thing that you could sort of wave a magic wand and get people to uh, change their mind about one thing. What do you think is the most fundamental thing to get things going in the in a better direction? Is it the causality? Is it the the purposiveness? Like, what is the what is the one you know thing at the top of it all that you would like to change? Well, I I think I would say, Mike, that rewriting the textbooks is the most fundamental thing because that's what people learn from. And if you if you don't teach the various developments that have occurred that are outside the range of the modern synthesis, then uh, generally speaking, you won't have people uh, looking to do the work that would be necessary. So I'm reluctant to try and put my finger on the major thing to do now. What I've done instead of that, Mike, is, is to gradually accumulate around a dozen younger people around me not to work under me, I'm not asking them to do my work. I'm um, trying to encourage people um, to think in ways that the textbooks haven't really taught them to think. And I find that very exciting. I leave it to them as a new generation to define what you're asking for, what would be the most important thing to do. And I probably can't tell them that anyway, even if I wanted to, because um, as I look at the ways in which research has changed in biology, even over the last 20 years since I retired from an official position in my university, it's, it's changed out of all recognition. Who now folks well, maybe you do, Mike. I don't know. Maybe you do still. But who pulls tiny tubes over a Bunsen burner to create a one micron electrode to try to stick it into a cell that's reluctant to take it anyway? You know, I mean, this is how I started, of course, recording from single Purkinje fibers in in the heart in way back in 1960. Um I'm just out of date on the various techniques that are now possible, including, as I indicated earlier on, the fluorescent microscopic techniques, which are so beautiful, but I think so limited because there's so there's only a limited number of molecules that you can label uh, at any one time. And how are we going to deal with that kind of problem when we want to work out all of these questions about epigenetic inheritance, what passes down from the body to the germline, I I would feel my role is to encourage others to think out of the box, um, but I'm certainly not going to 
aim to say what I think is the most important thing to do. So in a sense, I'm rejecting the question, Mike, aren't I? But I think I've learned enough now to know that people like me looking back on it all are not the best people to judge where it should now go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that uh, I, I agree completely as far as the details of where it goes and so on. But I think in, in your work and in your writing, you've emphasized a couple of really fundamental changes of perspective that I think have so many trickle down effects if they were more widely recognized. So, so you know, the, the uh, incredibly important role of, uh, of, of goal-directed activity in biology, the top-down causation, the work on, no, you know, no, no privileged level of causation. I mean, I think these are, these are incredibly fundamental ideas that once, once right. you know, once they get on, people take them on board, they make you see biology in a new way. And that then informs all the specific things that you may do later, you know. Yes, and, and of course, on that, I'm very firm on what I say about those general principles. And I look forward very much to a day when, well, let, let's see what I really want to say here. Um, a lot of time has been wasted. <laughs> I say that advisedly. Um, when I <coughs> organised... I helped to organize a meeting in 2016 at the Royal Society here in England. It was actually a joint meeting with the British Academy, which is the, the Academy of the Humanities and Social Sciences, particularly including the philosophers. We, we, we build it as a discussion meeting on what we call new trends in evolutionary biology. I was... Um, I was subjected to the most extraordinary um, attempt to get that meeting cancelled. We we went through the committees, the standard committees of the Royal Society, the British Academy, to organise a discussion meeting, and um, 21 other fellows of the Royal Society, though, so those are top people in the field, wrote to the president of the Royal Society, this meeting is organized by Dennis Noble. It should not occur. Full stop. I I spoke with the um, chair of the committee that approved the meeting, and his position, therefore, was in something of a difficulty anyway, because after all, approved, his committee had approved this meeting with enthusiasm. And... In the end, when I said to him, you know, there's no problem, John, you can invite, they can, they can come to the meeting. It's an open meeting, you know, nothing's to stop anybody coming and talking at the meeting. And we're open to add further um, uh, speakers to the meeting. But that, of course, is not what they wanted. And it took, oh, nearly a year to sort out that it was a complete waste of time in the end because the meeting occurred almost as a gladiatorial confrontation. That is not how discussion meetings work. We discuss when we have an agreed basis for discussion. We can't manage if people have um, are coming largely just simply to ridicule the other side. I think that's a great shame and I think it's a big blot on the landscape of academia here in the UK that that happened. The meeting incidentally went ahead and it, it produced a good publication by Interface Focus. Um, there was no, in one sense, no problem in the end, but the bitterness that that generated has never gone away. And I regret that. I think we we do our best science when we respect each other's uh, views and ideas. Um, we, we don't do it when uh, what you're faced with is more like a gladiatorial confrontation. But having said that, um, since that time, the attempts to denigrate people like me have have almost disappeared. I think there's now a more... Um, how should I put this? 
there is a greater realization that there is an important case here. I spent <coughs> nearly three months earlier this year interacting with a Forbes journalist, Andrea Morris. Um, and it was three months of interactions because she was doing what a top journalist should do. Um, probing every single major idea and assumption in what I was saying to test it to destruction almost. And what she did in the end was extraordinary too. She she rearranged all of that into a coherent video uh, which accompanied her Forbes article. What I found from that interaction was if you've got the opportunity to take somebody who's quite naive, because initially she was, she knew there was a big argument. She knew that there was major disagreement. She probed and probed until she got down to two things, really. First of all, I think your major discussion, your major difference from the other side is you think purposive behavior in organisms is a characteristic of organisms, and they don't. Well, she was quite right on that, of course. Um, but then I said, well, but in addition to that, Andrea, there are about three major processes at the molecular biological level where I think they've got it completely wrong. And I went through the ones I did earlier, the self-replication of DNA, which simply does not happen in long um, DNA uh, genomes, the existence of the Weissman barrier, and I'm afraid I still remember, I've forgotten what the third one was. I'm sure it'll come back to me when this meeting is over. Is that epigenetic inheritance? Is that part of the... Uh, it married? probably is, yes. It, it, that could, could well be. There is epigenetic inheritance, yes, exactly. Yes. Well, and I... I actually think that may be the prime basis of speciation. You see, the main point of evolutionary biology is to explain speciation. That's what Darwin thought, is why he called his book The Origin of Species. But then, you know, the funny thing was he never thought he had answered the question of the origin of species. Why not? And that's a very interesting question. He didn't think he had because, as he well knew, the artificial breeders, artificial selection, had led to new varieties, but never to branching speciation. And then he realized that the reason why they got their varieties was that they were preventing interbreeding. So he understood that for speciation to occur in a branching way, there would have to be something that stops the interbreeding. Now, of course, in his Galapagos Islands, he knew what was happening there. The islands are separate. So you could get branching speciation just through a particular finch species developing in a different direction on the different islands. But of course, he realized the rest of the world is not like that. You've got to have some mechanism by which the interbreeding can be stopped. Now, an interesting physiological fact, many epigenetic changes can influence the reproductive likelihood. And that's just a physiological insight. Um, it's a very sensitive thing. It, it can be just a psychological change in that uh, variety of the organism that leads to them just not wishing to mate with the their former colleagues, if you want to call them that, um, or it can be uh, just actual physiological changes in the reproductive system. That may not happen too often, but you don't need it to happen too often to get branching speciation, which is what I think has happened. So I actually think that epigenetic changes may well have led speciation but that's a speculation i can't prove that i put the idea into an article i did uh, last year um and it's up to other people to find out whether it's possible to prove one way or the other it may be very difficult though because we'd have to do what 
what has been done in the case of the Galapagos, which is to follow particular species over many generations, and that has been done with the birds on the Galapagos, with uh, Mike Skinner's work, looking at how far apart the different finches on the different islands have have grown and how many of those changes were epigenetic and how many were hard DNA. The interesting thing is both, almost equally. That itself doesn't prove that the epigenetic changes led the DNA changes, but at least it's possible that is the case. Anyway, I'm good at throwing ideas out, I think. <laughs> I'm not so good at doing the experiments that could now prove them. Wouldn't modern synthesis also say that it's random mutations that leads to speciation? What do you oh, say to no, that? No, I don't, I, only so, and I don't think it can. Random mutation, other than in, for example, controlled mutations such as the immune system, controlling the rate of mutation in the B cells, other than that, Random mutation is an exceedingly slow process. One of the points I put to Richard Dawkins two years ago was, you know, Richard, I agree with one of your calculations. <laughs> he said, which one? I said, well, you calculated how long it would take for monkeys um, typing away randomly on a typewriter to create a particular sentence in English. It was actually from Shakespeare. Me thinks it looks like a weasel. 28 characters. And he calculated, of course, that it would it would take billions of years for that to happen. I mean, just by chance. Unless somehow the system knows when a monkey had got the right key in the right place and could hold it. And of course, he realized that couldn't be the way it's done anyway, because what does the holding? I mean, it is obvious that, that cannot be um, totally random. Now, I, I think that, yes, natural selection with random mutation, totally random mutation is a background process and must occur. So I don't deny that um, natural selection in that sense occurs, but I do say that it will be exceedingly slow and I think other processes, epigenetic included, have speeded the process up. And you can see that just from looking at the first comparisons between genomes way back in 2001, when the Nature paper on genome sequencing of the human was published, together with a very interesting comparison with everything from um, yeast through flies, through to worms, through to higher organisms, and then finally to the human. And what you find, the two categories of protein that were studied in that way, the chromatins and transcription factors, they've grown by accretion of whole domains of functionality. The, the modern versions of those proteins, if you want to call them modern, the latest, as it were, in the evolutionary process, are vastly more complicated with many more domains with particular structures that enable them to be receptors, channels, or whatever. And it's impossible to see how that could have occurred by chance. I think there must have been processes during the evolutionary process that enabled uh, organisms to rearrange their genomes under stress. And Barbara McClintock showed that over half a century ago when she was investigating corn. And so we've known about this kind of way of speeding the process up for, for very many years. Incidentally, she got she eventually got the Nobel Prize for mobile genetic elements. That was in uh, 1983 when she was aged 81 so she'd managed to stay alive during the whole of 50 years in which her experiments were rubbish only to be awarded the nobel prize in 1983 was she then taken seriously no there's another extraordinary fact the fact that she was given the nobel prize for mobile genetic elements has not led to people seriously 
taking into account what the sequencing of the human genome has shown in comparison with other genomes, that is, rearrangements of um, the domains has occurred during evolution. And that's not point mutation by point mutation. It's taking whole chunks and reassembling them. So, <laughs> sorry, as though you are using, um, well, in my days, it was bits of Meccano. Today, it would be bits of Lego, wouldn't it? Um, giving a child a construction kit. And if it's already got stuff that's reformed, preformed bridges, preformed tunnels, or whatever it might be, uh, a child will get there to build a new structure very quickly. If it's got to work with the tiny original Lego bricks, it will take ages. There's the difference. <laughs> Um, just uh, uh, since as, as we're heading towards the end, I just wanted to, to see if you want to say a couple of words. I know that um, you have a lot of interest in various kinds of Eastern thought and approaches to these kind of uh, bigger questions. And I'm curious what, if anything, you want to say about that and what, uh, how, how, how that interest actually uh, dovetails or informs or is informed by the biology that you've been doing and the philosophy of biology that you've contributed to. Yes. I I think it's been unfortunate that philosophy and science have diverged. I've interacted with some very good philosophers, and they have succeeded over the period of time in which I've interacted with them. Anthony Kenny is one of them, Alan Montefiore another, Charles Taylor another, Um what they have contributed is, of course, not new discovery <laughs> that, that we shouldn't expect of philosophers, is clarity of thought. Mm. And for Fatuma, for example, to write, um, purpose has no use in science, full stop. Uh, it seems to me without any justification, without any discussion of what it would mean for an organism to be purposive, which I think is largely the anticipatory process of knowing what other organisms are doing and being able, nimble enough and quick enough uh, to react. And I see nothing as a problem in that in science. We, we now talk of building AI systems that can do that and giving them the intelligence to do it. Why don't we think that it must be characteristic of living organisms? I've come to many of the positions I've come to, Mike, through what I see as important philosophical mistakes made by the reductionists. First of all, for denying there's any other way of looking at a living system, that it, it must always be through reductionist analysis. And there is no philosophical basis for that. There's certainly no philosophical basis for uh, dismissing the idea that organisms, cells, tissues, organs, and so on, naturally constrain the molecules within them to do what they do. And that doesn't seem to me to be particularly controversial. It must happen. But it is, in essence, also a philosophical point. that You cannot have a complex system without levels of interaction. And once you've got levels of interaction, you've got downward as well as upward causation. But there we are. Um, I don't know whether that answers the, the point, Mike, but I've always been fascinated by um, <clears throat> some aspects of philosophy since uh, being a student and being introduced by the philosopher Stuart Hampshire many years ago at Un U University College London, where I was a student, who introduced me to Spinoza. Mm. Now, Spinoza was the main opponent of Descartes. And that's very interesting because... In Descartes, you can see the beginning of the Weissmann barrier. He, he wrote, if I knew what was in that sperm, I would be able to predict the organism. And that is the very much the idea that from the DNA, you would um, automatically 
uh, predict the organism. Spinoza very clearly said no. It was in a letter that he wrote to the Royal Society in 1663 or 5, I can't remember exactly now, Concipium armus yam si placet, conceive, if you will, a little worm in the blood. This little worm would understand the interactions between the particles of the blood, but it would have absolutely no idea that the function of the blood was to circulate. And it is a statement of the principle of seeing the whole, not just the parts. Now, in those days, of course, a scientist and a philosopher was not a separate person. <laughs> and I suppose what I am saying is I, I largely regret that the two have diverged. I'll just close with the last question, which okay. is more just practically speaking. I know you, sp you stress the importance of studying bio biological networks and functional networks. And yeah. I'm wondering for people who want to actually apply this, towards curing disease and for therapeutic potential. Maybe you can touch a bit about why it's important to actually be looking at functional networks and biology for that. Very important indeed. I, I like that question a lot. And I think we need to get back to what we were doing before the genomics revolution. What we did then was to study the networks and ask the question at a network level, what could modify this functionality. My own work around 30 years ago indicated that sufficiently clearly to a pharmaceutical company, Servier in France, that they spent a considerable amount of time looking for chemicals that would be able to interact with an HCN1 protein. That's a channel protein that conducts both sodium and potassium, which was one of the mechanisms that we found in the heart underlying rhythmic activity. And what we showed was that if you could produce a drug that could block that mechanism, you would only produce roughly a 10 to 20 percent change in frequency would slow the heart just a little. Even better, it would slow it greatest when exercising with a lot of adrenaline because then the effect is larger. And that's exactly what they did. They produced evabradine, which is a drug doing precisely that. And it helps people who need their heart rate to be reduced particularly during exercise. Otherwise, they're more likely to have heart attacks because of ischemia and, and associated problems. I, I think that came from a systems analysis. And so did some of the early um, work of Jim Black in producing, um, well, that, that was largely on gastric um, treatment in, in and in related to uh, pH. Uh, and it was, as he always admitted, largely a functional analysis that led him to uh, several major drugs that he developed uh, during that period, way back in the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s. And he always said, you've got to get back to that kind of analysis. At the, at the DNA level, I don't think it will work. And that's been shown recently. There's a, a paper by Hingarani and colleagues from University College London, published just last year, October, the um, British Medical Journal um, uh, published it. And what they looked at was the ability of the polygenic scores, that is adding together all the contributions of particular genes to a given function, to see whether those polygenic scores, because a single gene doesn't do it, so the next idea is to say, okay, add a large number of gene effects together, all their association scores, 
and ask the question, does that predict? It doesn't. It's a very important paper. October 2023 in a British medical journal. What that tells us is that that's too low a level at which to see the functionality. I think we've just got to get back to network analysis and what we were doing before the genomics revolution reasonably well, it seems to me. But that's a very important question. I would love to see us move back to that kind of approach. <laughs> Look for ways in which one might cure Alzheimer from restoring function up here. Don't bother about whether or not you can do it from a DNA level. You probably can't. But somehow try to restore the function. People are trying to do that now with the idea of possibly creating stem nerve cells that could replenish the brain's function. Who knows whether they will succeed? But it seems to me that going deliberately for restoring function might be a better way uh, to proceed. And do we need to succeed? Yes, we do. Those illnesses are now creating in aging populations a cost to our health services that is beyond what we can afford. There are too many of us, me included, living a long life. <laughs> and in the end, forming a burden to the rest of society. But we we haven't focused on those diseases. We haven't succeeded in getting the, the, the cures for them. And we need to do so. So I don't think you could ask a more important question. Perfect. I think that's a, that's a very important point to end on because it also yes. puts it in practical perspective for people that why is it that exactly. we're not able yes. to solve so many diseases by just focusing on DNA and genes and what could we be sure. doing instead, which is important to yes. everyone. Sure. And that, that Hingarani study is, is quite stunning. The, the problem is, yes, there are some associations, but there are many that are false positives as well as positives. So it's rather like looking at a drug and whether it should be approved for um, for treatment in by the FDA and using exactly the same criterion. What they showed, in effect, is the polygenic scores are almost useless. What's happened to 23andMe? They're collapsing. Why? Because it isn't predictive. And they know it. Well, but that's another story, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Uh, Dennis, thank you so much. This was great. Awesome. To okay. See my you. my, you my thanks. Hi, everyone. If you wish to be notified of future podcast episodes and my writing on longevity and the frontiers of biology, please subscribe at livelongerworld.com. And if you're enjoying the show, please leave a rating on Apple, Spotify, or elsewhere. Thank you for listening, and I will see you next time.